By late 1953, the economic boom that had arrived after the Second World War had already transformed the country. We were a self-confident people for the first time since 1929. People putting money in the banks, the real wages were going up 4.5% a year. It's just incredible to think about that now. America in the 1950s was very rapidly becoming a consumer society. People were buying more and selling more than ever before in history. For the first time, more Americans were doing white-collar work than manual labor. Advertising, marketing, and public relations were now the preferred professions. Well, I could certainly do with eight or 10,000, but I don't know anything about public relations. Who does? You got a clean shirt, you bathe every day, and that's all there's to it. In the shadow of the Cold War, it seemed almost patriotic to be part of the American economic miracle to be a member of a corporate team and follow its rules. When I became a salesman, like the man with a gray flannel suit, I was told where to buy my clothes. It might not have been a gray flannel suit, but it better be a blue one. And there was a lot of choices of colored shirts as long as they were white. You called attention to yourself if you deviated from the norm, and nobody did. Nobody did. We all looked the same. I think people kind of like to be dressed alike and to follow the same sort of social customs. You were expected to have at least two drinks at lunch, preferably martinis. If anyone said, I'll have a uh, Perrier, <laughs> they would have been laughed at. And when they advertised for secretaries, they specified good looking. It was not a good time for women in the workplace. Miss Lawrence, this is Mr. Rath. Miss Lawrence will be your secretary. How do you do, Miss Lawrence? Very glad to meet you, Mr. Rath. We always give a new man the prettiest secretary. There were no female managers. None. Uh, it wasn't even considered. In the 1950s, the woman's place was in the home, in the embrace of a loving husband. By 1957, 97% of all marriageable men and women were married. And if they cared to have a social life, they stayed that way. It was a couple's society. We did things in couples, barbecues, and it's always couples. If we knew that the person was divorced, we might have a second thought about asking them the thing was to be married and keep the home together. More and more, that home was on America's new crabgrass frontier. In an era that favored conformity, it was perhaps no surprise that by the end of the decade, a quarter of the population lived in the tract homes of the modern suburb. Moving in for us was the beginning of a of a happy experience, of a challenging experience. Everything was similar. One of my friends was Ruby. My phone rings and he says to me, Hal, I have a problem. I said, what's the matter? He said, I can't find my house. It seems kind of remote and bleak if you look at them from the air. But in those little cookie cutter houses, on those straight streets that met at right angles, a lot of good things were happening. Children were being born at a very fast rate. There were three obstetricians and the obstetricians were open till 2 a.m. in the morning. This was the place to raise children because it offered everything that they could want.
I was here at my own home, across the street at the neighbor's home, down the block at a friend's home, without, uh, without any restriction, without any, uh, any feeling that uh, I was violating uh, any, um, anyone's territory. The emotional core of the early 1950s was all about stability. Both my parents had experienced the Depression. Both my parents had experienced the war. I know that they looked upon their little house in Lakewood as a refuge from many of the things that had troubled their, their early lives. The activities were centered around the home. We had a lot of parties. People were of the same age. Our interests were alike. We came together that way. We seemed all to be interested in what we were doing for the good of all of us. It was a fabulous life. And life was getting better for a lot of American families. Propelled by the powerful economy, they were stepping into the middle class at a rate of more than a million a year. With extra money to spend and plenty of shiny new merchandise to choose from, people bought things whether they needed them or not, sometimes just to match the pace of their neighbors. We had an eye on consumer goods all the time. Keeping up with the Joneses, when people would give us a call on the phone that the television set was just delivered, it wouldn't be long before we'd be down having soda, watching the new television. And as soon as we left there, we would say, that's what we have to have next. A new television would soon become the thing that everyone had to have next. 